I feel like I'm on a talk show here. You this are. Is... Hey, I got my United Airlines pen, so I got to switch out pens here. So I'm very <laughs> appropriate. <laughs> well, you talked a lot about the merger, but we'll, we'll get back to that for in a minute. I'm, I want to dig right in with something that uh, is very important here to our audience. You may have heard that airlines and GDSs have been in the news a lot lately, maybe in the courtrooms a little bit, and um, about concerning the future of travel distribution. Where, where does United stand on this? Well, Mike, we want to be uh, easy to do business with. Right. We want to be in uh, uh, all distribution channels, or as many as we, as we can be in. Um, we um, are uh, uh, rapidly evolving as a business, as you know. Uh, with the unbundling of our product and the rebundling of our product and the technological change and our, our growing ability to communicate directly to customers. Um, and it's important uh, that our partners, whether they be partners as GDSs or partners in online travel agencies or, 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 or others, keep up with that degree of technological change. Um, but we do want to be, we, we do want to be in, in a broad array of distribution channels. Um, at the same time, those distribution channels have got to be cost efficient uh, and they've got to be technologically uh, adaptive to the products that we are creating and delivering. And, and although we've had this, uh, you know, what it was cl colloquially called unbundling, there are many, many, many more things to come. And we have to make sure that the GDSs can keep up with the degree of, of, of change of, of the airlines. So your plans for Direct Connect, is it, you, does Direct Connect grow? Or? Well, I, I guess I view the, the uh, you know, United.com site uh, we're now also the Continental.com side merging into the United.com side as, as direct consumer, right? And, right? and I think that, uh, you know, what grows is going to be based on consumer demand. I mean, we're going to be where the customers want us to be. Uh, we want to be on every shelf we can be on. Uh, there's no rule, however, that says that, uh, you know, Campbell's Soup has to be on the Kroger shelf. Campbell's Soup can also could be on the Safeway shelf or the Drew Osco shelf or the Dominic shelf, right? Uh, but uh, but we, want, we, we, we want to be where there's a cost-effective distribution, and certainly uh, the, the web for us is our, is our least cost distribution channel, but that doesn't mean that, it, that I would expect all travel to go through the web, no. Right. Okay. So, uh, switch topics. You've been uh, critical from lack of support that you as an airline have been getting in Washington. Um, from your perspective, what's, you know, what's broken in, in uh, Washington? And what would you have them do differently? Well, well, what's broken in Washington is pretty tough for the amount of time we have. But uh, we'll add another couple hours. If it I won't helps. even go this there. Good, it's a topic uh, I like talking about. You know, about. I think that I think that, that fundamentally the U.S. lacks an aviation policy. Right. Uh, and I think it's important that we have an aviation policy. I think that aviation is a good. Uh, it is. Uh, it is important for the exchange of people and uh, and and cargo and ideas and and. Um, you know, it's, it's an unalloyed good. And to tax us more heavily than alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, um, to brutally overregulate us, to enact um, exceedingly oppressive regulations that have often very little consumer benefit, uh, but cost us an enormous amount of money to comply, is not a good aviation policy. And we clearly need also investment in our air traffic control system, uh, because there's so much value in doing that. There's so much. Uh, there's, there's, there's not in terms of the time value and the throughput, but the fuel efficiencies alone. And there are many studies that show that we could save 10% uh, of our fuel burn if we had a modern air traffic control system. Right. And, uh, you know, the, the New United, we, 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 we burn 100 million barrels of jet fuel a year. And if it only half of that in the United States, saving 10% of half of that's a lot. Right. And uh, it's not just for us, but it re it's reflective in, 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 in consumer prices, in the time of people holding. I mean, there's so many things that we can improve. And this is, this is technology that exists today um, and, and can be used today. And it's, it's, just, a, it's just a shame that, 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 that we're making so little progress. Part, part of that, uh, in terms of the cost of modernizing air traffic control, means that you also have to retrofit or fit your aircraft mm -hmm. to also, uh, you know, uh, take advantage of it. Is United willing to incur those costs to do so? You bet. Actually, we have a lot of equipage today already in our because we have quite a modern fleet. Right. And we're going to be taking a new aircraft, have a lot of the equipage. The, the, the problem is a lot of the equipage we're just carrying around, burning fuel with the weight, but no benefit. And right. so, the, you know, I don't mind pitching pennies with the government. 
What I don't want is pitch my penny and no, no other penny comes in because you know, we invest in the equipage and then there's no utility to the, to the equipage. Well, then we've made a mistake. Right. Um, so you mentioned uh, you know, aviation policy. Um, specifically, let's talk about the Department of Transportation. Uh, what, what kind of grade would you give them right now? Well, I, I don't, I'm not in the business of grading a regulator, so I, I think that's a, that's a pretty dicey thing to do. Um, so I, th I, th I thought I, I'd try. You yeah. Know? I, I, think we'll, I think we'll just stick to pass-fail here. Okay. And? Pass. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'd ask. Um, so now let's get back to the merger. Uh, United is now the largest airline, but does that make you the leading airline? Uh, no, not yet. No, no. We're becoming the world's leading airline. And, uh, and we have work to do. There's no question about it. I mean, first of all, integrating these two carriers takes time and effort, uh, and, and we're, working, we're working hard to do that. Um, we've got to get, uh, we've got to be a global, we have to have a global, well, we're a global airline. We have to have a globally competitive product. Right. Uh, we're working on that. Many of our aircraft are, are at that state. Uh, others are not. There's, there's no question about that. And we're just, as, we're, so as I announced earlier, we're investing $550 million to bring the existing fleet up to make sure it's globally competitive. And of course, we'll be taking new aircraft. We've got 50 787s on order. We've got 25 A350s on order. We've got options for a whole lot more. We have, a, the, we have the best single carrier network in the world. Uh, we have lots of opportunities to grow. So, uh, but it will take time. And we, we've got technology we need to invest in. Uh, we've got facilities that we continue, we've got great facilities we need to continue right. to invest. For example, in Houston, we're in the first phase of a billion dollar project uh, on, in Terminal B uh, that we're starting, uh, we're, we're starting soon in the first phase of that, of a three, three phase investment in Houston. So we have a ways to go. Uh, we need to bring our work groups together. We need to make sure we've got the right culture. So we have a ways to go. But I'm very confident that we will become the world's leading airline. We're creating the world's leading airline. We've got tremendous assets and tremendous people. Uh, and uh, you know, I've, I've been in the business 16 years, and this is the first real opportunity uh, uh, that, uh, that that sort of anyone at Continental or United has had uh, to create something as durable and spectacular as what we're doing here. And I'll tell you, I've got a lot of very excited folks as a result. Any surprises during the merger? I mean, positive or negative? Well, you know, there are, there are always surprises. I think what surprised me the most um, is the, just the, the huge number of decisions that have to be made to harmonize um, just policies, for example. Right. For example, I, I think this was in the paper, but, you know, at, 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 at Continental, when we were loading pets into the aircraft, we had the pets facing the aircraft. You know, had the pets facing away from the aircraft. You have to make which way does the dog face. I mean, I never would have guessed <laughs> that that was important in a merger, but it turns out it is. And there, are, there are all these things. Is that, that what they were picking about there out all there? All these things that you have to do. Um, uh, to, and, and it just takes a lot of time. I mean, I, I, the, the way I analogize is like a big table with a whole bunch of dominoes, but they're not all connected with each other. And your job is to go and knock the dominoes down one by one. They're dominoes you never imagined would be there. And right. sometimes when you knock one down, you got to kind of go to knock it down, but you can. And you got a lot of smart people and, and interested people and, and enthusiastic people uh, bringing these two carriers together. Right. So you mentioned about uh, you know, becoming the largest airline, and now we talked about being the leading airline, but you're, clearly your competition isn't just domestic here sure. in the States. So on the global landscape, who worries you the most? Are there any carriers in particular? Well, look, we, we're a global. Your point is exactly per, is well taken and, and spot on. We compete not against the Deltas and the Americans of the world. We compete against the British Airways, Iberia, the Air France, KLMs. Uh, we compete against uh, against the Middle Eastern carriers. Right. We, we compete across the entire globe, and we view our competitors. We don't look at you know when you see slides that are at, 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 in our management decks. I mean they're not just how we're doing against American or Delta or anybody else. Right. We look at the the whole world and how are we doing across the whole world and, and competitively. Uh, looking at the product, what do, what do our global competitors do? Because we're a global airline. Right. So, uh, you know, in this, in this very brutal and uh, brutally competitive business, um, I worry about everybody. I mean, if I didn't, I'd be insane. Right. Yeah, because I, I read somewhere that Emirates is poised to be the, or at least they poised to become the largest airline by 2015, or at least give you a run for the money in that respect. So when you mentioned Middle Eastern Airlines, I mean, that's, again, your, your competition is global. Do you, I mean, do you see, is being largest as important as being leading? 
No, I don't think it is, but I will tell you that, let's, let's talk about Emirates for a moment, if okay. we could. Emirates is a, is a good example of an airline that, is, that has a government that has a superb aviation policy. Emirates is part, I mean, Dubai understands the value of air travel, understands the value of having uh, a, a huge hub for the traffic flows, and there's a lot of natural traffic flows that where, where, where Dubai is appropriately situated. Right. Um, it, it, uh, you know, Dubai views Emirates as an integral part of its economic development, of its cultural development, of its transportation and tourism, of its cargo business, of its trade. I mean, it's an enlightened policy with an enormous amount of government support. And I don't mean government support in terms of subsidies. I'm, I'm not right. saying that. What I'm saying right. is focus and attention to the value of air travel, something the United States government lacks. And that's unfortunate. And Emirates is a, is a well-run and successful airline, but it also has a government that cares and doesn't throw roadblocks and doesn't overtax it and doesn't overregulate it and doesn't beat it down. Right. I think you're all. So, so ask me how I really angry. feel. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, uh, last question. Uh, we watched that United commercial. I, I still can't believe that was 30 years ago, you know, that when that ran. Um, looking to the future, what are we going to say about United? What will United look like 30 years from now? Well, I think 30, I, th I, think, I think even far sooner than that, but I think 30 years from now, I think United will continue uh, to be the world's leading airline. I think it'll have a, uh, a great product. I don't know what the, what the, uh, um, you know, airplanes themselves will look like in 30 years. They're, I mean, you know, um, by then well, I'm sure there'll be a, some kind of uh, replacement for a narrow body aircraft beyond the, the NEO or whatever Boeing's going to call the re-engined aircraft. The RIO? I don't know, whatever they'll call it. <laughs> um, uh, but I think that the, the United will be uh, what we plan on United to be in as we integrate the carriers and invest in it. Uh, I think it'll be a carrier very focused on business travelers. I think it'll be a carrier that'll have a spectacular network, as it does today, only a larger network than that. Uh, it'll be a carrier that will have uh, cutting edge technology uh, and uh, great onboard service and uh, will have a culture where people enjoy coming to work every day and are proud of what they do and give very good service. Good answer. Well, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jeff Smizer. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Have a great week. And uh, we'll see you all at the reception. Thank you. Good night.